With my aunt coming to visit this weekend, I knew that it was time to do some spring cleaning. So I thought I would look online for some spring cleaning tips. And instead, what I found was an article by Kelly Head entitled, Spring Cleaning a la Testosterone. It was so helpful, so helpful that I wanted to share some of it with you all today, especially you husbands. Kelly writes, last year my house barely survived our annual spring cleaning day. In fact, both the fire department and the Red Cross still have us on their monthly check-in list. So this year, when the time came to divvy up the chores and dig into spring cleaning, I made a cheat sheet of sorts for my husband to refer to. Vacuum, she writes. Much like the leaf blower, except it sucks in instead of blows out. Don't let this alarm you. It doesn't need more torque, speed, or ram, or whatever it is you did to the dishwasher. Dustpan. Contrary to popular belief, this is where you sweep the dirt, not under the hallway rug. Dust cloth. A cloth designated for removing of particles of dirt from every flat surface in the house. Hint, look for your old lucky shirt. Sponge. Used to gently wash away food particles from dinnerware. It is not necessary to use your 300 PSI power washer set. This was given to you in the hopes of cleaning the exterior of the house. Hint, hint. She lists a whole bunch more and finally closes with this final note. Well, duct tape may be a wonderful plumber's aid, and it's really, it is really not the best solution for keeping the bathroom towels in place. And Jamie's teacher is still asking why his homework was stuck to his forehead last week. For these reasons, I have hidden the duct tape and distributed your picture to the local hardware stores. In today's gospel, Jesus is doing some spring cleaning of his own. He's just come from turning water into wine in Cana, and people are now beginning to see who he really is. Unlike in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, however, this account happens early in Jesus' ministry, and it's not directly linked to his death. It's a proactive event in his ministry that shows Jesus' intentions and his focus in his ministry. Notice he took the time to make a whip in John's reading. This wasn't just a spontaneous act of anger. No, it was a planned event in which Jesus is putting God and the temple above the almighty shekel. Also, unlike the synoptic gospels in this account, Jesus doesn't accuse the money changers of turning the temple into a den of thieves. So the problem Jesus has isn't one of corruption. No, the problem was that they missed what they had right there in front of them. The temple... The whole point of the temple, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, whom John has just called Jesus a chapter earlier, is standing right there in front of them, and they don't recognize him at all. I suppose that's why everyone needs a good spring cleaning, not just for your home, but for your life, because things so quickly build up, the stuff responsibilities, the appointments, so much that we can fail to recognize what's truly important in life. In today's first reading, we heard what God says is most important in life, the first commandment. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. In other words, Loving God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, that is to be our number one priority. And Jesus is saying the same thing in the gospel. He's saying, look at what you have. 
Look at who you have right in front of you. You want a sign? Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Of course, they misunderstood him in the moment. Even his disciples didn't understand what Jesus was saying in the moment. But ultimately, Jesus is pointing to a person and not to a building, to God and not an idol. So did you catch that? That in this gospel, Jesus isn't just talking about the first commandment, but also the second as well. We can make almost anything into an idol. But like first century Jews, we in the church have an uncanny knack for turning church buildings and what goes on in, in them into idols. We don't intend to do this, but sometimes it happens, and when it does, the church's mission and ministry suffer. I was reading an article in the Christian Century by uh, Rich Melheim, a Lutheran pastor. His program, Faith Incubators, is actually the foundation for the confirmation curriculum we use here at Holy Spirit. Well, in the article, he talks about the church and the changing role of education, shifting it more and more back home, similar to the model that Luther proposed with his small catechism. He says, the real incubators of faith are not the church staff, but parents and guardians. Now that may terrify some of us who feel unprepared. But later on he suggests something even more radical when it comes to how we understand the church building and church planting. He says, today, don't start a church. Start a preschool that happens to meet on Sunday mornings. That got me thinking about how the church has changed over the years how we've made the church a place where religious things happen. Less religious events go on in the home or even in the larger community outside a church building than they used to. And that has negative consequences for how we understand our sense of Christian vocation. Because church isn't the place you go to do religious things on Sunday mornings. It's the community of faith that helps you do the necessary spring cleaning so that God remains the number one priority in your life. So what if, what if our church community saw this building as a tool for showing Christian hospitality to others who may not be in any way affiliated with the church? What if we trust that not just on Sunday mornings but on Tuesday nights Jesus shows up during the line dancing? What if he suddenly stopped by a birthday party being held in Grace Hall one Saturday afternoon? Or when we host the Columbus Spirit, a drum line that's going to be here later this week even for the Grand Blank Winter Guard Expo? Or in a couple of months when the Baker College nursing students come here and have their graduation ceremony here? Or what if it's just when somebody comes to drop off some recycling in the recycling bin. It's kind of like Jesus when he shows up unexpectedly at the temple in Jerusalem. What if we saw this building as a tool for helping people who may know next to nothing about Jesus see what they already have as a result of him, namely the love of God, and not just when they might miss church on Sunday mornings. And since we all are here this Sunday morning, what if we saw this time as an opportunity to refocus our attention on seeing Christ in others and being Christ to others for the other 167 hours of this week? I know that's easier said than done. So this week, let's start small. Most of us have easy access to a camera, right? So see if you can take a picture of God at work in your life sometime this week. If you take it on your cell phone, make it your screensaver or your background image so that every time you use your phone, you're reminded of God's call on your life. 
If you take it on a regular old camera, have it developed and put it right there on your fridge or, or someplace where you'll see it each day a couple of times. Guys, you might even consider duct taping it somewhere <laughs> to remind you that God shows up in places and ways that we least expect. And when you recognize that God has shown up, know that God's always working to clean out the dirt in our lives with His love and grace. That way, when Jesus does a little spring cleaning in us, we aren't so much surprised as we are satisfied by the result. Amen.